Okay, is it visible now? Yes, please. Uh, could you please put in, in slideshow? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mayanja, for the introduction. I'm Martin Baruku, and uh, I'm on this work with the, uh, Dr. Joyce Nasamba. And as the, uh, Dr. Med has highlighted, we are looking at uh, motivated reasoning and political civility uh, during the just concluded uh, elections that we had uh, in January uh, 2021. And specifically, we are looking at how uh, the attachments that uh, as individuals we have towards our parties, uh, the attachments we have uh, with our candidates that we support, uh, how it leads us into behaving in a way that may not be required. And we are specifically looking at uh, how that relationship uh, is influenced by psychological inflexibility, uh, perceived threat, and political sophistication. I will be trying to uh, clarify on some of these concepts uh, as we go through uh, the presentation. Uh, but basically, we all still have uh, fresh memories of what happened uh, during the campaigns, during the elections, and afterwards. We all know that there were a number of happenings, people died, uh, some people were imprisoned, um, some people probably are still raised, and all this is because of behavior that was probably not warranted uh, during the campaigns, during the elections, and after the elections. And the question is, what can then, can we do from the psychological perspective in order to help that in the next elections or in the elections to come, we don't experience uh, the same kind of uh, events. And also part of our motivation is that actually, when we look at the present uh, academic engagement around politics, we seem not to see uh, psychology actively involved in these discussions. And our motivation is to actually start uh, psychological debates into what goes on uh, in the political arena of this country. So to clarify a bit what political civility is, or what we call the uncivil uh, political behavior, here, uh, from different studies, uh, people have conceptualized this uh, concept in different ways. Uh, one, uh, Moots and Reeves said that it is actually behaviors that lack respect uh, or frustration with the opposition during uh, political times. Uh, it has also been defined as rude democracy. Yeah, we have democracy, yes, we can participate in political activities, but with what level of tolerance uh, we have in these democratic uh, political processes. Uh, some people have also called it rudeness in the political arena, which is not different from uh, rude democracy. Uh, Moodman uh, calls it, uh, that is 2020, uh, he calls it dis disrespectful uh, democracy that we participate in political activities. We want to show that we are tolerating people, but to what extent we show respect for each other, to what extent we engage uh, in civil uh, debate with the level of uh, respect that is required of each other. How do we tolerate uh, dissenting views uh, from people of opposing camps with opposing ideologies, uh, people who tend to support uh, candidates that are not of, uh, of our choice. Um, when you look at the different um, descriptions of uh, political civility, there are a number of things that tend to come out as common threads uh, of things that are involved in and civil political behavior. One is name calling, and I think this has been common where we refer to people by names that are not of their own, but that tend to shame them. 
uh, using insulting language, being vulgar or being obscene towards uh, particular candidates, towards uh, supporters of opposing parties, uh, misrepresentation and lying about um, the opposing uh, camps so that they look bad in the eyes of the public or in the eyes of those that we are trying to talk to, mocking candidates and their supporters, character assassina uh, assassination, uh, belittlement, all these tend to describe uh, uncivil political behavior. But also from what we have been seeing, we can add uh, aggressive uh, verbal and non-verbal behaviors uh, that we have been witnessing during uh, the recent elections. So exactly what happened uh, during the elections that we can characterize or we can call uncivil behavior. Um, the most widely reported and of course research forms of visibility in our context, but also globally, is when we see police and armed forces and those in power uh, trying to repress uh, the opposing parties. Of course, there are a number of events that we can uh, relate with right now that we can identify. For example, we all know what happened to uh, Patrick uh, 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 Amriat when he was going for nomination, when he had to appear at the nomination ground barefooted. Um, we can remember what happened uh, on the nomination day still with uh, Robert Chaglani and so many other events, as we can see in the picture here of one of the uh, painful uh, experiences that Patrick Oboy had to witness or go through uh, on his campaign trail. So what we normally call a political violence or uncivility is when we see government cracking down on opposition candidates and their supporters, uh, when we see uh, government arresting, um, people from the opposition uh, blocking their campaign rallies or disrupting those rallies and blocking campaign meetings. Of course, we witnessed all these, but these are dangerous things. And of course, they yield uh, a number of responses. Uh, we are saying such happenings result in political backlash and increased dissent, um, which is often expressed through unacceptable behavior such as demonstrations, destroying campaign materials, and so many other ways that people can try to express their anger and frustrations uh, that they meet during the, uh, during the campaigns. As we know very well, we had uh, the November demonstrations or the riots. Uh, we had killings within the same period, but this continued and even before actually the actual campaigns we had seen what had happened uh, in the NRM primaries. However, um, civility does not stop with those who are taking uh, center stage in the campaigns, those who have offered themselves to as candidates. There's normally what happens uh, within uh, the electorate. So we are saying some of these are either unnoticed because they happen at the lower level within the community, or they are given less attention or less reported. However, uh, if we pay close attention to media reports, um, to police reports, we can identify uh, some cases where disability has happened uh, at, within the electorate. And for us, this is where our focus is. Um, the most common that we have seen uh, in the recent elections was actually cyber attacks uh, and cyber violence, actually according to According to APC, which is the Association for Progressive Communication, uh, their report about the recent concluded campaigns, where they, um, in their study, they followed up uh, the behavior um, on social media, particularly on Facebook. Uh, they noticed that actually there were a number of incidents that would happen to both male and female uh, candidates, but uh, they were affected differently. The male candidates of often experience like hate speech, abusive comments from uh, those who follow their uh, Facebook pages. Uh, while for the female candidates, 
Um, at least 18 percent experience sexual violence in terms of uh, sex related comments and uh, suggestions that happen on Facebook, uh, trolling, and also body shaming. It's not uncommon to hear people hurling insults to female candidates on things like you are beautiful, uh, your body looks nice, or you look sexy, or you look ugly. All these things we experience them and we see them happening. Of course, there are confrontations between supporters of different parties. Uh, a case in point could have been uh, during the Arua primaries. Uh, of course, that was before uh, the recent elections. Uh, we remember how uh, the supporters of NRM and the supporters of the Pro Power movement um, uh, ended up in a confrontation that actually ended up in loss of lives as well as um, arrests of political actors. Of course, we have recklessness, especially in the speech of candidates and their supporters. Um, of a generalization of negative attributes, we have seen how people tend to pick the negative attributes of candidates and attributing them to tribes, to regions, to religions, to ethnicities. And all these are meant to, uh, to discredit uh, the opposition or to discredit people in the other camp. And of course, what is common destruction of campaign materials, like we you know, or we see on streets, the facing of campaign materials, and so on. Um, when we go on what is documented, for example, we can see um, what happened during the campaign in terms of what was reported to police. If you look at the, uh, 2020, the 2020 police report, for example, in yellow here, we highlight the crimes, some of them, not all, some of the crimes that were reported to police uh, relating to the NRM primaries. Uh, in red, we see the crimes that are in this report relating to the November uh, 2020 uh, riots that related to the arrest of one of the uh, presidential candidates. So we can see that actually there is a lot of civility that goes on uh, during the campaign period, during the elections, and as well as in the aftermath of the elections. Uh, when you go still up to now, when you go to social media, when you go to Facebook, WhatsApp, we still see a number of uh, engagements, uh, most of which actually tend to be negative, tend to be uh, uncivil. So in this study, we are thinking that uh, motivated reasoning is one of the causes of uncivil political behavior. Um, and we are saying for certain reasons, probably the election that we had was the most uh, polarized in terms of political identity, uh, where people in political camps were so strong about their parties, were so strong about their beliefs, about their candidates. And so that gave small room for tolerance. Uh, people identifying themselves uh, along political lines, but also we saw some commentators trying to bring in uh, arguments along religious lines, along tribal identities. Uh, for example, it's not, um, it's not a secret that some top political actors were saying that, for example, loop is an issue of the central uh, or an issue related to you know, the Catholic church and things like that. But all these were unfounded uh, comments and probably unwarranted, but because of the way we tended to be polarized uh, during uh, the campaigns, during the elections. Uh, so these kind of identifications uh, provide the motivations for you know, distorted political reasoning. Uh, when you identify so strongly with the party, uh, it becomes difficult for you to separate your personal reasoning uh, from the standpoints of the party, from what your candidates believe in. If we are to be ourselves, it is possible to realize that 
there are certain things that the party says or your candidate says that actually may not believe in. But because of the strong identification with the party, the party's position uh, becomes your own position. The party's behavior becomes your identity that you want also to be uh, part of that. So you are already you. persuaded. Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Baluku. Uh, now I'm going to invite another candidate, another presenter. Or, or you can summarize. Okay, I can summarize. Um, I can go quickly. Uh, so we talked, uh, we also thought that perceived threat could also be a magnifying factor. I'm not going to go into the details of that. And also looked at the role of uh, uh, psychological flexibility as another magnifying factor. And what we really find out uh, quickly is that um, from our participants, we had, of course, the majority from the NRM and from the NUP, and we noticed that uh, participants from NUP and from UPC or those from UPC were very few, were more likely to engage in uncivil behavior. Um, and in terms of how these relationships work out, we noticed that uh, actually perceived threat uh, acts as a mediating factor between uh, motivated reasoning and, and civil political uh, behavior. And also quickly, we noticed that um, psychological flexibility increases, uh, increases the effect of political uh, of motivated reasoning on political civility. Um, in terms of just quickly, in terms of what our findings imply, is that belonging to uh, certain parties seems to be a predisposing factor uh, to engage in uncivil behavior, and I think why this is the case needs to be um, to be explored. Could it be the culture of the parties? Could it be the nature of the membership for particular parties? Could it be the political climate within the country that tends to provide uh, some kind of hostility towards certain parties. We also think that addressing uh, political, uh, politically motivated reasoning is important, but probably this will require uh, different approaches for different parties and also involving uh, leaderships of the different parties are sort of this dilemma. And then it's also important for the state and political leaders uh, to actually avoid or to minimize action that may be perceived as threatening to the lives of certain people, uh, threatening certain parties and their candidates. Thank and you lastly, so much. okay, please, it's fine. Thank you so much, Dr. Baluku. Uh, actually, I need to emphasize the fact that we, are, we strictly have 15 minutes for each presentation uh, because of the limited uh, time. Uh, we have a li uh, limited time and at any so it, it will not be sufficient for us. So basically, I'm going to invite uh, the second uh, presenter, and that is Dr. Linda Nakalawa, who is uh, uh, a lecturer at the department, whatever, uh, School of Psychology, and uh, Andrew Melon, a PhD uh, fellow. Uh, Dr. Whatever, Ms. Nakalawa is uh, going to present about her study uh, in which uh, she asserts that the failure uh, of the youth employment problems in Uganda is due to uh, the unsuitable westernized, westernized view of the mindset. And she advances uh, uh, the African conceptualization uh, of the mindset as arising from and shaped by the social context. Uh, it is quite an interesting study. And I request you, uh, Ms. Linda, to start uh, with your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayanja. If we could have Dr. Baluku stopping to share, I can share my screen. And while he does that and I share my screen, I just want to say how honored I am to be able to talk about some of my PhD work. And I am going to keep my presentation light because I'm doing my PhD among young people and these young people are tuned in from all over the place, so they don't want to listen to so much theory. But Chus is here to speak to everybody, like the presenters yesterday said, to Simbu Day. And we are here for everybody. Um, 
So I'm sharing my screen now. Please help me confirm if you can see that. Yes, please go ahead. So that is my presentation. It's about voices that hold us back. And I'm looking at a female Ugandan youth as she reflects on her empowerment journey. And this is coming out of some of the studies that I did as, as I was starting out on my PhD. That's the brief overview of my presentation. As you can see, it's going to be very brief and I'll get right into it. So empowerment of Uganda's youthful population is at the center of government and many of the development partners agenda. And the question of mindset has taken root in the discussions about youth empowerment. When you look at the Uganda youth policy, those of us that are familiar with NDP3, that's the National Development Plan, everybody is talking about youth mindsets. But the literature on mindsets does not present a clear theoretical understanding of the nature of Uganda youth mindsets. Not only that, but also the contextual factors that shape these mindsets. Now, psychology would be able to help, but the existing psychological theories, some of us have heard about the growth versus fixed um, mindset theory. They are not really suitable for exploring youth mindsets in the Ugandan context. This is because they, they tend to speak to an underlying that is um, westernized, mostly British and American view of the mind. And these look at the mind as individualized about the, 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 the one person. And this is at odds with the African conception of mind, which looks at the human mind as emerging from social cultural processes. I'm so pleased to have been influenced by African philosophers and writers uh, like Nsamenang and all the, 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 the theorists that have talked about the concept of Ubuntu, which talks about I am because we are. And in, in, in Uganda, in Luganda, we talk about Ubuntu Ulam. I was also influenced by Bakhtin's dialogical theory of mind, uh, which states that individuals take on various mental positions due to constant, uh, the, the mental dialogue that they have with multiple voices in their minds, and this come in from their social culture setting. So the purpose of this particular presentation is to illustrate that different mental positions that a, a female Ugandan youth takes on or that she is forced into based on the voices that exist in her social setting during her empowerment journey. The methods that I used, I won't spend too much time on this, but we are looking at the, the story or the narrative of Namuli. That's a pseudonym, I've changed her name to preserve, ethically to preserve her identity and privacy. But I picked her story out of a transcript of a focus group discussion that I carried out with youth advocates in Entebbe Town Council. And when I picked out her story, I did two things to it. I subjected it to a model of narrative structure analysis uh, by someone called Laboff. It helps us to arrange a story in a logical time, time flow. When someone talks about their experiences, they can jump from time to time time space to time space. So this model helps us to um, arrange the story in a logical flow and it gives us three time periods in Namuli's life. I also took on another analysis method called the voice-centered relational method. And this helps us to tease out those voices that influenced Namuli and the different positions that Namuli takes on or that she is forced into uh, based on these voices. Just a little bit more about the voice-centered relational analysis. It helps us to tease out voices and aspects of stories, like I have said, that may otherwise be ignored. And this requires that you read the same story four times. And each time you read that story, you're focusing on a different aspect. If you can see the areas that are in blue and, 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 four, and uh, green, uh, reading two and reading four, 
Um, reading too helps me to tease out the positions she takes on, either by herself or positioned by others. And also reading four helps me to tease out the social culture and historical context within which Tamuri is um, living her life. So the summary of the results I'm going to tell you about, first of all, about Namuli. She's a female Ugandan youth. She's in her mid twenties. Namuli is such a beautiful story. She has successfully lived with HIV since she was born and she lost both parents as a child and was raised by relatives, but she is currently a youth leader and a leading advocate for young people living with HIV in Uganda and Africa. And she has been supported through Taso in Tebe. They provide care, counseling, and empowerment. Um, and this has been Namuli's story. So the results I'm going to tell you about, they focus on one, part A, three times periods in Namuli's life as we are going to see. And then in Namuli's own words, the voices that influenced her at these times. Um, and finally, how Namuli positioned how she is either positioned by other people or how she positions herself based on these stories. So we can now hear from Namuli in my voice, but her words. So the first period is when Namuli drops out of school in S6 and she has no funds to continue to university. She says about this period, this rich neighbor's daughter came to the driving school where I was working. She could not believe that I was the one working there. She asked me, Woli Wano, that's, are you the one who is here in, the, in Luganda? She thought I was of too low a status to even work there. And she says the different per, um, that the differences parents put in us as we are growing up determine how we see things. So in this case, she is positioning herself as a child from a poor family and comparing herself to a child from a rich family. Still in period one, when Namuli drops out of school in Essex and she has no funds to continue to university, there's a time she's reflecting. I remember a time I wanted to start a business of selling chips so that I could get some little money. My aunties asked me, the whole of you, how can you sell chips? So I also gave it up because I was, I was too special to sell chips. So she's positioning herself as too special to do small business, but remember she is struggling and she does not have the money to go on to university. But in spite of these challenges, uh, Namuli's story gets better. The second time period that we look at in Namuli's life is when she is seeking a government service from the resident district commissioner. She says, I wanted a passport. I went to the RDC's office. Do you know needing a service and you go to this office and you are so scared? I had been told that if she's going to sign for you, make sure you lie about where you are going. I told her I was going abroad for a conference and she signed for me. Another girl was thrown up because she said she was going to Dubai to be a house girl. They shouted at her that she was going for prostitution. Imagine judging her without even knowing her life story or her challenges. Our leaders, it depends on who you are. Where do you come from? Then you can get a service. Here Namuli is positioning herself as an anxious youth, but she also says that she is privileged compared to some of her peers. The third period is when Namuli graduates from university with the help of a well-wisher and she starts to work. When she graduates from university, people say, ha, she says about this time, ha, people talked, sent a Yazijewa, where did she get the money from? Yafunyaba Sajja, she got sugar daddies. But I, have, I had told my life story at a conference and one of the participants was touched and decided to help me find sponsorship for campus. She continues. Then even when I performed well, when I got a first class, people slay, said I slept with lecturers. They argued, who gets a first class in that course? That is the environment we, go, we grew up in. People are not appreciative, but sometimes you just ignore. So here she's positioned as a successful female graduate and she's battling negative public opinion. Period three, again, when um, now she has graduated, Namuli has graduated and she's starting to work. Um, she says, 
remember she has just got a job, fresh graduate. When a parent gets to know that you are working, you become the father and the mother at home. They can even borrow money and you have to pay. You are trying to build yourself up, but indirectly they are, tear, they are tearing you down. And here her position is of a new salary earner held back by too many demands too soon. So you can see that at different time periods, um, Namuli is positioning herself or she is positioned differently. Sometimes she fights back against these positions. What are some of the take home messages I would like us to not forget from this presentation? Youth mindsets are made up of, and they are shaped by the different voices that the youth hear or are subjected to in their social culture setting. Even when youth seem to feel to, to say that they are independent and they make up their own minds, these voices are there in their subconsciouses and sometimes they respond to those voices without even meaning to. And they find themselves negotiating with those voices in their minds and those voices affect them whether they like it or not. But also youth are not passive in the face of these voices. They take up different positions. Sometimes they agree with these voices. Like remember when Namli said, ah, Zezena, how can I use, how can I make chips? She agreed with her aunties, and that was to her disadvantage. But sometimes youth protest against these voices. So when we hear issues of defiance, for example, in our community, we might be rash to judge the youth, but is it actually? Um, an effort for youth to push back or to protest against the voices that are, you know, trying to put them down. The other thing I want us to take away from home is that the position um, to take away, take home from this is that the positions that youth take determine their actions, whether they like it or not. And their actions determine their outcomes on the empowerment programs. This can be positively or negatively. Yes, Namuli succeeded, but along her journey, sometimes she felt disempowered actually. For example, when she goes to the RDC, she, she, she felt that even if she was empowered, still she had to lie. She felt she could not be herself. And sometimes these voices empowered her. Because and she took uh, uh, when she took a firm stand against these negative voices, she was empowered and she was able to fight back against them and to still encourage herself. The last thing I want to talk about is that the empowerment programs, however good they are, they cannot succeed without considering the voices that influence the youth. Remember the voices are the ones that make up the mindsets. So if we are going to pay attention to mindsets, ask the youth, who are some of the people that influence you? That is how I met Namuli. I asked this group of, of, of um, youth advocates in Entebbe, who are some of the people that influence you? And as they were all telling their story, that's how I noticed that Namuli seemed to be telling a very specific consistent story. And we can see how these voices that influence the youth are coming out based on the social culture setting. So empowerment programs cannot succeed without considering the different voices that influence their youth. And these are the ones that make up their mindsets. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd like to thank my supervisors, uh, Professor Julius Chikoma and Dr. Mayanja Kajumba. I thank so much the entire youth leaders and, and especially Namuli, she knows herself, and our, my founder, Andrew Mellon Foundation, and very gracious support from the CHUS graduate program. As we say in CHUS, to see Mbude, we are on the move and we are not moving back. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. Uh, actually, we have some questions, but I think we shall have one uh, question and answer session at the end. Uh, we also have, in fact, I've seen a question for Dr. Baluku and another one for Madame Linda. So at the end of the presentations, we shall, we, will be, whatever, we shall be responding to those questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we have uh, the next presenter, uh, uh, Madame Annie Otwine. Uh, she's presenting about uh, you, you whatever, occupational transition and uh, 
uh, counseling and guidance. Good afternoon, everyone. I am presenting uh, part of, it's actually, these are my findings from my PhD thesis. And I am presenting with Dr. Mataj Leon. Um, introduction, uh, this, uh, this paper is about career guidance and counseling in schools. And if we watch the space, you'll find that students are finding it hard to transit from school to work. And this has been, um, it has resulted in too high youth unemployment. For instance, according to the National Planning Authority, the youth between 80 to 30 years, they are finding it hard. Only 27% have moved on, 62 are in transition and nine have not started. So when you look at that, you wonder whether these are actually products of our schools, who we are preparing for the uh, job market. Uh, the research questions we are looking at, what is happening in Uganda? What are the implementation challenges? What are the levels students' career self-concept uh, concept? And then what is the level of students' occupational information awareness to enable them to do confident transition from different levels of education? And uh, the hypothesis we shall look at uh, we we'll see, we are saying there is no relationship between students' um, first and second choice, career interest awareness. There's no relationship between career guidance and counseling and students' career self-awareness in schools. There's no interaction between career guidance and counseling, occupation information sensitization, and students, um, yeah, there's no interaction between the two. And then we shall also look at if there is any strong relationship between occupational information sensitization and students' career self concept. And my, uh, cost, uh, the main concepts are career guidance. And in career guidance, we are looking at programs in schools, the timing, models of delivery, sources of occupational information, and challenges. And then for career self concept, we are looking at students' career choices school subjects, work values, abilities, and career interest. And then on your occupation information, we are looking at self-knowledge, educational and occupational information exploration and career planning. Uh, the theories that are guiding or guided this study, we have um, career self concept theory by Donald Super. Then we shall also look at person environment fit theory by John Holland, and then occupation information, uh, cognitive information processing model by Pearson. Methodology, this was a um, marked stage research. Uh, 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 it was a mixed, uh, mixed um, method where I used my marked stage research designs. The first design was the survey at baseline to establish what is happening in schools. And then the second was a quasi experiment. And the study was carried out in Southwestern Uganda, in secondary schools, especially those which are government aided. And the study population were majorly senior six students who were in transition from high school to university. Uh, the sampling strategy, I used again my stage sampling strategy. For schools, I used inclusive and exclusive sampling technique. For students, it was stratified sampling techniques since I was dealing with one class. So I studied the whole class as a block. And then for teachers, I used purposive sampling. And the total sample, secondary schools, I selected four. And then students were 400, and then the teachers were 40. Um, the reliability levels were, uh, were established at 90%, at 90 uh, alpha of 90, and then for staff members, it was 92 
Then the instrument which I used, it was at 93. And then ethical, um, ethical requirements were also fulfilled for this study. The results, a total number of 89 males were studied and 72 females were studied and the average age was 18.5. So yeah, according to the first objective, we actually found that I found that the level of awareness about career guidance and counseling in schools was at 98.8%. And the utilization level was at 87%. The programs which were being implemented in schools, the major ones were General Special Careers Day. This is a one day of where parents are invited and students are guided, and then regular class meetings. And the timing was usually at the beginning of the term and end of term. The main mode of counseling was group counseling. And the main sources where students felt they benefited most were interaction with professionals, then achievement and progressive tests, and then parents, teachers, and peers. However, challenges were found during implementation. Students had a poor attitude. There was little time for career guidance in schools and lack of information about existing training opportunities and lack of information about the relationship between career awareness and academic achievement, and then lack of self-awareness. Other challenges were discovered and these included lack of confidence and counseling skills on the part of teachers and counselors, inadequate up-to-date career information, limited support from head teachers and school administrators, and then a government policy which was found and supportive, particularly on compulsory subject sciences at all level. Um, about the level of students' career of self-concept awareness, we discovered that the majority of the students had moderate self-awareness about the school subjects they needed to do or which they were doing in relation to their uh, career choices. About work values, again, they were between moderate and good. While abilities, the majority had moderate awareness about the abilities they required to do certain careers. Then, um, about career interests, we looked at the first two career areas which people were, which students were interested. We found that for males and females, the first career interests were scientific, probably due to the government policy. Then the next one was business for males and office for ladies. Um, then in that order. However, what is interesting is that the first career interest does not correlate with the second career um, interest, meaning that the guidance that students are given does not help them to connect between their first and second career choices, depending on their abilities, work values, and then the subjects that they are required to do while in school. So when I did a correlation, there wasn't any significant um, uh, connection between the first career self-concept awareness and the second career concept awareness. Then for hypothesis two, the relationship between career guidance and counseling and students' career self-awareness in schools, it was found to be very significant. And probably this could be attributed to the level that the students were, they are about to do career choices. So a lot of effort had been made. Um, then for career occupation information awareness, which is very key, I used national information occupation uh, coordination committee guidelines by national uh, for NCDA. This is the body that uh, regulates guidance in the US. I would it was tested and it has areas of competence and it caters where people look at and see where they are very 
strong to enable them make career inform, uh, choices. These competencies were 10, they are actually 11, 12, but you find that it was so scant, students had very scant information that they needed to make uh, clear decisions. And this was done at pre-test and then at post-test. So when all these were findings for occupation information where people, uh, students were found to be strong in career occupation information awareness. However, uh, I went ahead and did an analysis to find out the impact that occupation information awareness had on students' career uh, self-awareness and then subsequent career decision-making. So as I said, that the study had both the, um, uh, the, we did baseline and then after that, I based on it to do treatment. Two groups were made using random sampling. So the treatment group, when we looked at the post, uh, post test values, they showed only 2.3, 2, uh, 203.18. 60 variation, while control only had 200, which means that the sensitization which I did, which was part of the train treatment in schools where I did career guidance, which patient information sensitization did not have any effect or it, it had very significant effect on the occupation information students had about the knowledge they needed to make career decisions. However, when we look at F, um, it really wasn't very significant. But we went further to see the moderation effect. If occupational information, if it was improved, if it would have any uh, impact on students' career self-awareness and on, student, on career guidance in schools, so when we look at this moderation, I used a uh, process analysis in SPSS. So there wasn't any significant moderation by increasing occupational information sensitization in schools. However, there was a very significant relationship between um, occupational information sensitization and students' career self-awareness. Meaning that if we increased information uh, sensitization among students using modern techniques, modern information, if we used um, online resources, students are likely to benefit from those sources so that they have improved career guidance, uh, career, uh, they get improved career self-awareness that is very key in helping them to make career decisions in future. So these are my findings. And um, the conclusion is that career guidance and counseling exists in schools. Um, so students, however, students level of self-awareness as a result of career guidance is moderate and their knowledge of occupational information, which is necessary for them to make career decision making is also very low. So um, institutions and policymakers and schools are employed to join hands so that we step up career guidance in schools to help students make sensible career decisions that will actually be an answer to an employment situation in our country. I submit. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, that was a very good presentation. Uh, basically, we can go to the question and answer session. We have some questions that have well, I've already received here, and uh, I think I'm going to go in the order in which they've been uh, asked. Uh, Dr. Baluku, hello, Dr. Baluku. Yes, I'm present. Okay, please. Uh, the first question goes to you. And uh, this is uh, uh, Miss Helen Amongin 
I should like to whatever some clarification on what you mean by psychological instability, inflexibility, psychological inflexibility. Oh, oh I ask all the questions to you. Yes, I've seen a number of them down there. Okay, please go ahead and answer all of them at once. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And um, thank you, Helen, uh, for the question. I have actually already provided the, uh, the answer in the chat. Um, unfortunately, because of the time, I could not go through the details of all these concepts um, in the presentation. But um, psychological uh, inflexibility actually uh, refers to you know, that situation uh, when someone uh, responds with dysfunctional behavior, dysfunctional responses, what we call psychological rigidity uh, when reacting to certain situations. And this kind of reaction tends to uh, undermine or ignore uh, one's chosen values. So we can say that it is psychological reaction to a situation that is uh, detached from one's uh, values, uh, that the person has chosen to guide his life. So there are those situations when you find yourself uh, not in touch uh, with yourself. Uh, you are not in touch with your emotions. You are not in touch with your uh, thoughts. And sometimes we tend actually to be overtaken by thoughts. And then we ignore the emotions. We ignore what is happening uh, all over our bodies. So the opposite of it, um, which is, psychological flexibility is when you choose uh, functional behaviors or functional responses to a given uh, situation. Um, in the context of our research is that the failure to adopt uh, or to adaptively respond to environmental situations, the environmental challenges during the campaigns, during the uh, that polit political volatile period uh, sometimes leads to challenging thoughts and challenging feelings. And if people are not able to handle these feelings, they will end up uh, in uncivil uh, behavior. Uh, then we had uh, a question from uh, a question from uh, Richard Valikowa. Uh, who says, uh, thank you for this relevant study. I do not know whether you can be able to say briefly about which political, uh, I, somehow he clarifies, which political party uh, tended to be more psychologically flexible and which one ranked higher on flexibility. Again, sorry if I missed out during that presentation. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, unfortunately, we do not run this in our analysis, so we cannot um, tend to say which one was flexible or which party had less flexibility among its members. Uh, but it's analysis that is possible, and we can do it because we have the data uh, that we need to do that analysis. Um, our interest was not on in which party has more flexibility, psychological flexibility among its members and things like that. We just wanted to see on a general level, does flexibility influence uh, the way people will respond, especially the way they will behave uh, in, this poll, uh, in the campaigns? Will they respond with civility or with uncivility? Um, Another question comes from uh, Dr. Sam Ouma, uh, who says, who were your study participants? How might root democracy limit expression of participants' views in this kind of uh, study? Yeah, this is an important question. Um, again, um, if I can go quickly to the slides, I did not, because again, because of time, I did not talk about the uh, study participants. I don't know if I can share that, Chair. Yes, you can share, please. Okay, thanks. Okay. 
Is it visible? So basically we collected our data uh, online uh, and so we reached almost all parts of the country. Uh, we collected our data from 38 districts and this is, we do not go there physically because of the current uh, limitations in the movement, but at least the people who responded to our questionnaire uh, were from 38 districts. So of course the majority, uh, 40%, uh, from Kampala and Wakiso. Um, in terms of the age composition, they were basically very young people, um, uh, ranging from 18 uh, to 70 years. But of course, I'm saying uh, they were very young. Uh, the average is around 25 uh, years of age, though we did not report uh, that here. And in terms of uh, education, and probably this is another limitation of the current study, is that at least 75% of our participants were either students or graduates of bachelor's degrees and higher degrees. And yet we know that a big number of the electorate is actually less educated. Unfortunately, we, cannot, we, could, we couldn't reach to them uh, through the online questionnaire that we used. Probably some of them are not even on WhatsApp or Facebook. And this is the next stage of our study because we need to reach them. We need to get uh, where they stand in regard to uh, these concepts and how they influence their uh, political behavior. And how does uh, the political situation affect participants' response in this kind of study? Uh, I can say that it is really challenging uh, to collect data on these kinds of uh, variables and in the situation that we know. Um, majority of the participants whom we reached, as you can see, we our link uh, for the questionnaire reached about 912 people, uh, 439 people attempted to respond, and only 162 uh, were able to give us usable information, the majority of whom would stop in the middle, especially where they would reach what they would find to be more politically sensitive questions like when you ask about their party, what they think about their parties, they would tend to leave the questionnaire at that stage. So it's not easy uh, to have people's views freely expressed, uh, especially where people think that they can easily be identified. Of course, for those who try to get back to us, we would clarify on um, the anonymity nature of the study, um, and the fact that we use the website that is based in Germany, so there's no way that anyone around here would access their IP addresses or their telephone numbers. So we would assure them of these things. But majority would say, no, still, I don't feel comfortable uh, to continue with this uh, questionnaire. So briefly to ask your question is that it's really not um, easy to conduct this study. Uh, some people were even asking us, are you safe? Will you not be, you know, will, uh, will not, don't you fear that someone will come to say, why are you doing this kind of study? But we are confident that this is purely psychological study. It's non-political. And after all, it's uh, looking at all the parties, uh, all the candidates that were uh, involved in the presidential elections. So, yeah, no worries about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Baluko. Uh, now we go to, actually the presenters, I see you're trying to answer questions, but uh, I would, we would rather answer them to, for the benefit of all those that may not have asked. So I'm going to request uh, Linda to answer all the questions, including those that you've answered privately, uh, for the sake of those that might be listening in and unable to ask. Thank you. Linda, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayanja, um, for purposes of covering everything that I have answered. Let me refer to the responses that I have already put in the chat. Uh, thank you, Helen. You asked what data analysis method did I use? And first I used Labov's structure and um, narrative analysis. 
to help me tease out Namuli's story into a temporal flow out of this whole mix of an a of a focus group discussion. Then after I had Namuli's narrative or story, I used the voice-centered analysis method by Jilly Ganetal to dig deeper into that, that story of Namuli that I now had. This way, I read the story several times, and each time I read it, I looked out for different things, the voices, the positioning based on the voices, and, and so on. So these are all, they are both um, qualitative analysis methods, and the structure analytic was, um, structure analytic narrative analysis was first step. And then I went deeper on the same story with the voice centered relational analysis method. And then Thomas Doughty asked really fascinating presentation. And thank you for highlighting the difference between Western individualized conception of the mind and the African collective or social conception. I wondered if you had any ideas about the key ways in which your takeaways might be re directly related to youth programming. Um, and I just want to focus on the response that I gave for everyone's benefit. Thank you, first of all, Thomas, for your question. First, we want to take a step back and look beyond the youth that we are working with you know, look wider, see their social culture setting, see their families, see their peer groups, see their reference groups. These are all voices that youth carry with them in their minds and they continuously influence this youth. So we may be saying one thing in our very beautiful programs, yet these reference groups are pulling in the opposite direction or they might actually be helping, but we don't know unless we uh, reflect on it. So it helps to build reflection sessions into our programs, ask the youth to reflect upon the people and voices that influence them. And it starts by the young people themselves being aware of this influence and to be able to watch how they themselves respond positively or negatively to these voices. In the end, we can actually empower youth to privilege, you know, the voices that help them to move forward. A lot of young people these days say, and I smile when I read it on, on my young people's WhatsApp statuses, I don't care about public opinion, you know, my life, my rules. But according to this research, these opinions live within their heads and they are often subconsciously negotiating with them. So when you say that it is okay, acknowledge your, that the social environment influences you, acknowledge your Africanness. There is nothing wrong with it, but don't just acknowledge it, make it work for you. I'm looking through to see if there was any other question for me. Dr. Mayanja, do you see another, any other question for me? Sorry, my, my mic was muted. Uh, there's one from Samantha at uh, 3.20. PM. She also has one from Lynn, uh, from Variko, and one from Sam Uma. Yes, please. Okay. I don't seem to be seeing uh, them. Oh, open. Oh, sorry. I, okay. Uh, Samantha, for Miss Linda. Thank you, Samantha Biake. We have, we have many youth in the country who may be going through the same life phase as Namuli. How best can we use Namuli's life to influence them? First of all, I, I really want to focus on the positivity in Namuli's life. You know, someone could say she had it difficult. She was born with HIV, she lost her parents and ETC. And she has so many negative voices around her, you know. But uh, Namuli today is this powerful young person because even when she was telling her story, she was recognizing the voices right there in the focus group discussion, but she was also laughing even at the times that she responded negatively, either by accepting the negativity in these voices, you know, or when she pushed back and she ended up responding basically in a negative way, she had now gotten to a place where she could reflect and see, hmm, I could have done this differently. And that is what we need to encourage our young people to do, to think 
to think through the voices that influence them and to accept that, yes, even if I am Miss Independent, I am Mr. Independent, there are all these things that uh, go on in my mind and I don't shouldn't just push them away. I need to face them head on. So it, it's really about um, that acceptance and being able to, to, to recognize think through these voices and take a good position or an, empower, an empowered position in response. Finally, from Richard Balikowa. No, not finally. Miss Linda, thank you. Would, would you kindly tell what your conversation with Namuli implies, especially as regards what should be done to make youths feel empowered? Again, uh, that self-awareness is the first step. Let us not use, let us not try to use what I've referred here to as Western conceptualizations of mind, because there are a lot of theories of mindset. But if we take them and just plug them into our programs, they do not, they may not be the best way for youth to appreciate that, okay, as an African youth, yes, there is globalization, I understand. But as an African youth, there are all these things that are going on without, uh, around me, you know? And those things don't just stay on the outside of me. They come, they go on in my mind. They go on in my mind and like it or not, they are going to influence me. So empowerment for youth in this case is helping them realize that yes, these voices influence you, but you're not helpless in the face of these voices. You can actually draw strength from some of them, or you can actually stand up against these voices. But this is something that should be done continuously as you're making each decision. The truth is that even if you're alone, Okay, and you're trying to decide some of the opinions that you take on as you're making these decisions, they will come from your clan, they will come from your grandmother who died so long ago. Voices, voices, voices everywhere. But the young person is not helpless in the face of these voices. Um, Linda, influence of FGDs on individual stories. Would you really argue that this is just Namli's story? Not at all, not at all. And that's the beauty of qualitative um, analysis. Trust me, because of that understanding of how quali uh, narrative analysis works, I can actually go back to that focus group discussion. And if I read it again and I did another analysis, I might be able to see things that I did not see at that time. You know, where Namuli bounces her ideas off other things that, um, that other people said. But I'm not out to prove whether this is Namuli's story or not. The history, the correctness of the history does not matter. With narrative analysis, what I privilege is, this is what my respondent said. This is the story they are owning in that time. This is what they are saying. This is what happened to me as Namuli is saying. So as a narrative analyst, I privilege that and I respect it. But I also know that even in the middle of that focus group discussion, she is feeding off the voices of other, other people within that uh, within that very focused group discussion, because I mean, these are youth that are also part of her reference group. I think that's what I can say for now. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. Uh, now, Anne, you also have a number of questions, uh, starting with uh, that of uh, Miss Anne Ampaire. Uh, thank you so much for the questions put forward. They are very provocative. I was trying to engage with Anne. Um, however, I will start with her question about teachers. What were the parameters that I used on teachers? Now for teachers, basically I really wanted the, um, I wanted in-depth information. Actually theirs was qualitative to 
know whether they were actually, they could support students, whether guidance and counseling was taking place in schools. Then further, uh, further we interrogated or I interrogated them on the kind of information they were giving to the students. And this was actually extracted from the instrument that I used to measure students' occupational information awareness. And then I, we also, I, with my team, I wanted to know what challenges they were actually experiencing as implementers of guidance and counseling in school. So the information was basically to support the students' information uh, but largely the, info, the study was on students. Uh, so, but I totally agree that um, with uh, what, what the, uh, teachers know will influence the quality of students, uh, what they will benefit. And however, in our challenges, we, I presented that teachers, most teachers lacked skills. Most of them have not gone through uh, you know, formal training in career counseling. And what I need to actually share with the uh, viewers is that when we talk about career guidance and counseling, people confuse it with guidance and counseling. But career guidance is that which specifically helps students focus on their career development. How can they trans uh, translate their education experience into the kind of careers they will select when they grow up. So you'll find that most of the teachers, because they lack that conceptualization, they only stop on guidance and counseling. Even the people who are, who are invited in schools to facilitate, they also stop on guidance and counseling, but they do not provide information on career uh, development needs of students. And that's why uh, as Helen has asked, Helen has asked and said that Ministry of Education has had this program for a long time. Indeed, it has been even going back to the days of colonial time. But this study, when I used the, the National Career Development Tool called NOIC, I extracted it and then handed it to, to a checklist to see how much information students had about self-awareness. Now self-awareness, we are focusing on mental health issues, which can facilitate one to choose a particular career and grow into, into it. Then about uh, education and occupational exploration. Uh, we're looking, I was looking at, can these students actually translate what they study in school into what they need to access a career to do a course at the university and complete it. So there were many indicators that were tested. And then the third area is career planning. With this information obtained from school career guidance and counseling platforms, can students use them to plan for their career? Can they look at issues of family, environment, you know, leisure, can they, you know, integrate them in their career decision making to come up with a confident career decisions. So we are, the study actually found that most of the students were very low on all these areas. And no wonder their career self-concept was also very low. You'll find that uh, actually some of the voices that I captured later, which I did present here, some students found that their career interests were actually totally different from the school subjects they were doing. And students did not have, you know, good um, conceptualization of the work values that go with certain careers. They did not have a good conceptualization of abilities they need to do certain uh, careers. So you find that most of schools, they will you know, focus on helping students to build life skills, to select subjects of choice. And I have already mentioned the challenge of the compulsory sciences. So you find that little is given to these learners on how their learning will make sense when they are transiting from school to the workspace. And probably that's why we have issues with the uh, with the youth transition, as I've already reflected, 
you'll find that very few uh, young people from school will immediately get a job. And those who will get a job will actually not spend more than five years in that job. So you'll find people running back to school to find their career identity. And I want to concur with those voices that Lydia is talking about. There are many voices that go into these young people's minds that career guidance does not make a lot of impact in their lives that will help them transit from one level to another. And even when they are adults, transiting, whether it is self-employment or to paid employment or someone being employed formally, people are finding it hard to stay in jobs because of shaky ground that career guidance and counseling is constructed in our country, I submit. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. And uh, I don't know whether we still have any more questions, uh, but when I, when I look through, it seems uh, all questions have been answered. Uh, I just need to, I think, and actually we're coming to the end, uh, to the end of our session. Uh, it is almost time. So Anne, uh, Martin, and Linda, uh, thank you so much for the informative uh, presentations. Uh, it has been a very wonderful session and we highly appreciate that. Uh, the audience or the people in attendance, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are very grateful for your participation. Uh, those who have asked questions, thank you so much. We are really very grateful. Uh, I think I just have to officially say that because of the limited time we have, uh, this comes to the end of our session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Chair. I've You're been welcome. honored to be part of this, uh, this session. Me too. <laughs> and great to meet you, Anne. Choose to Simbo Day for real. <laughs> yeah, to Simbo Day. Yes, and we are saying things that really impact our society. Thank you so much, my, my fellow presenters. It, uh, you know, you're talking about real life. We've, we've gone out of the ivory tower and we are now in the community. What really happens to people? Sorry, Dr. Mayanja. <laughs> we are waiting to be switched off. <laughs> and by the way, and by the way, we haven't thanked our hosts. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Okay. Oh, yes. Mr. Antende Michael. Oh, thank you so much. Bye-bye, okay. everyone. Okay, bye. And thank you, all the attendees. Bye. We are honored bye. by your presence. Bye, Lydia. Bye, bye Martin. Please bye, bye and don't forget, the, don't forget the presentations yeah. to come and those of tomorrow. Oh, yes. Oh. And, and keep the conversation going. Yeah. All right. Look out for the recordings. Okay. <clears throat> and embrace your Africanness. <laughs> it's a good thing. We can do a lot with it. I like that. <laughs> Michael, okay, if you don't switch me off, I won't stop talking. <laughs> Some of us now have to move to other sessions, so uh, have a nice time. Let me also go back to...